Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word Bible Study, a plain and simple book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse study through the entire Bible. Currently, we are in Daniel chapter 11. Now, um, in the first half of Daniel chapter 11, we, we, we discuss, let me pull up my timeline here, prophetic timeline. So, um, Daniel chapter 11 is a very interesting chapter for a number of reasons. One, the detail uh, descriptions that it gives through, for the end of the Persian and the Greece kingdoms, which corresponds also time-wise to what is known as the intertestament period of time. So in your Bible, from Malachi to uh, Matthew, which is about a 450-year period of time, okay? And so that, so Daniel, the God gives very detailed prophecies during that period of time, the end of the Persian kingdom and then the Greece kingdom. And then the end of the chapter, which we're going to get ready to get into, where he is going to deal with, um, let me go back to this image here, the feet of iron and clay, which he has been talking about this last kingdom, this last world kingdom. <clears throat> it will be the most evil kingdom. It will be the most, it will be the most evil kingdom because one, the, 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 the Antichrist, and I only use that term because a lot of people relate to that. You know, it, it really he's not called the Antichrist. <clears throat> I believe there's only one reference from the biblical standpoint of him, the, the term Antichrist being used. Mostly he's called the beast or the man of sin or the son of petition or destruction. During this reign, his reign, the seven year period, the great tribulation period, God would be pouring out his wrath simultaneously on during this period of time. So his kingdom will not be the most fun time, even though it will be the ultimate time for sin, the ultimate time for evil, the ultimate time for godlessness. Um, so if we thought that the time of the world doing Noah was bad, this will eclipse that time. And one reason why it will eclipse it, because the man of sin, and we're going to, again, get into this, his, um, his characteristics is that he is incredibly arrogant. He will speak blasphemous things against the God of heaven. So why I don't think, I don't know if he is an atheist in here, because... One reason is that he could be an atheist and still speak blasphemous things. We see atheists doing this now. The, the people who call themselves de atheists and deconstruction spend a lot of time trying to, to debunk what's in their minds a fairy tale, a figment of the imaginations. But this guy, I'm not convinced that he's going to be an atheist, which I will acknowledge he could be. He is arrogant. That Bottom line, he is arrogant beyond all <laughs> belief. So at the end of his reign, and we're going to, I'm going to try to get to this because we talked about this before. As we see the prophetic picture given that the whole book of Daniel really is comprised of explaining this image. Okay, the human image five of human image human statue five human uh, I'm sorry five world kingdoms that will rule the earth and then of course the last kingdom which is the feet of iron and clay it is doing this kingdom that Jesus will come Daniel said in Daniel chapter two that he will strike this image at the uh, feet and that's again indicating the time of when this is going to happen. I mean, because from an image standpoint, the, the rock, which represents the kingdom of Jesus, could have struck the image in his chest and pulverized the image. 
But the fact that it mentions he's going to strike him at the feet tells us when this is going to happen. In fact, it actually tells us that during the days of these kingdoms, Jesus will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. So we, we, we've been through this, this, this man of sin many times, many times. So, um, all right, here we go. I'm going to pick it up at verse 35. He says, uh, some of the wives will fall so that they may be refined, purified, and cleansed until the end, until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. So that's why I think at this point is when he probably shifts the thought now to the the last world dominating kingdom. He says, then the king will do whatever he wants. He will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And he will say outrageous things against the god of gods. And he will be successful until the time of wrath, until the time of wrath is completed, because what has been decreed will be accomplished. So during this reign, remember Revelations chapter 6 through 19, God is pummeling the earth with his with, with with just all kinds of judgment. It's not, it really, it won't be a fun time, even though this is going to be the greatest time for evil, the greatest time for anti-God, anti-Christ, uh, the greatest time for lawlessness, for sin, yet the judgment also will be poured out during this time. Um, But notice again, his character is that he will magnify himself above every God. Verse 37 it says, he will not show regard for the gods of his father, the god longed for by women, or the god for any other god, because he will magnify himself above all. Now, uh, if you're reading, I'm reading the Holy Christian Standard translation. So if you're reading other translations, and I know particularly the King James and the New King James, for one, so when he says he will not show regards for the God, God, in there, they put a capital G and say God, the God of his father. Now that, I'm going to leave that debate and argument for the scholars. In other words, you know, why the Homo Christian tra uh, translate, translators uh, put it as God's little God, and then the New King James put it little G, I mean, capital G. Now, because of that, this phrase, some people think that he might be Jewish, okay? By putting it, the God of his father um, could not necessarily be Jewish. It could be, it could be Jewish because Jewish people were very idolatrous, okay? But, um, so anyway, I can say I'll leave that that battle for the God, uh, for the, not the gods, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> uh, the scholars, okay? And then the next phrase, the God longed for by women, or again, other translations will say he will not long, he will not have regard for the desire of women. Now, some people concluded that he might be homosexual. Uh, I do not believe that that is what is being communicated here. I think simply what is being uh, communicated is that this man would be extremely arrogant and extremely driven. Okay, his his uh, as we're going to see what his focus will be, and and women won't be that. Okay, um, and then notice he says, or for any other god. So that's kind of his characteristics. So he's just not going to be a characteristics for any god. Okay, because notice he will magnify himself. Above all, so he would be the ultimate epitome of arrogance. Verse 38, instead he will honor a god of fortress. Then he says, a god his fathers did not know. And then he says, with gold, silver, precious stone, and riches. So he will be a god of fortress. He will be a military. He will, he will rule with military might. We know this from Revelation 13. He says, um, he will deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god. Now, the term foreign god is going to be very interesting because we know from Revelation chapter 13, Satan gives him his power. 
Satan. Paul says that the coming of uh, the lawless one will be by the working of Satan. So he will be empowered by Satan. And what is interesting about him, if you read Revelation chapter 13, what is interesting, of course, is that because his coming will be by the working of Satan, so his rise to power and might would be by Satan's power. Um, the world will worship Satan. So I think even at this time, there, there won't even be atheism. Notice the world would be captivated by this person. And not only would they be captivated by him, they're going to worship him, they're going to honor him, but they're going to also worship Satan, they're going to acknowledge Satan who gives him his power. Now, it's hard for us to conceive this now because, by the way, no one on earth during this time is the Antichrist because uh, even if you want to ascribe the Antichrist to certain people, not everybody likes the guy. No one, not everybody is in, you know, in, enamored with the person. Okay? But he will be a military mind, and we know that he will rule. Not only that, but... Uh, uh, um, you see, let me go on and read here. Verse 39 says, He will deal with the strong of the fortune with the help of a foreign God. And then he says, He will greatly honor those who acknowledge him, making them rulers over many and distributing land as a reward. So this again, this is again in more detail about what is going to go on with the Antichrist. So when you put this together with Revelation 13, you get a very clear kind of picture of what is going to happen at this time, during that time. And this kingdom is yet to rise. Verse 40. At that time, at the time of the end, so now he's stressing at the time of the end. By the way, during the inter-testament period was not the time of the end. That's why you, we know that he has shifted to this last world kingdom. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, but the king of the north will storm against him, chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He will invade the countries and sweep through them like a flood. Now, um, I'm not for sure that we could say that the, the, the term king of the south and king of the north is referring to the Assyrian kingdoms and the Egyptian kingdom, but I think the regions. Okay, whatever those regions would be at the time. If you want to look at a map and see what they would be at the time. Okay. Um, and notice he says he would invade the countries and sweep through them like a flood. He says, verse 41, he will also invade the beautiful land. Now that's Israel. He says, and many will fall. I'll, I'm going to show you a verse in a moment for that. But these will escape from his power, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of the Amorites. So again, whatever the countries are in those regions, Moab, uh, which I, a lot of these countries, the, the, the Middle Eastern countries, verse 42, he will extend his power against the countries and not, and not even the land of Egypt will escape. He will conquer Egypt. He will get control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the riches of Egypt. The Libyans and the Cushites will also be in submission. So the land of Cush, so a lot of the African nations there, Cushites. He says, uh, but reports from the east and the north will terrify him and he will go out with great fury to annihilate and completely destroy many. And he will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountains. But he will meet his end with no one to help him. Now this is, a bit, again, very interesting, deep, more a little more detailed about him. When we put this together with Revelations, and let me just kind of show you just one peek here. This is in Zechariah chapter 14. Notice what he says here, a day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided in your presence, and I will gather all nations against Jerusalem for battle. So remember we just read, he's going to turn his attention 
to the present land. He says the city would be captured, houses looted, and the women raped. Half the city would go into exile. The rest of the people will not be removed from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fought on the day of battle. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem to the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in the half east to west, forming a huge valley so that half of the mountains will be moved and to the north and half of the south. You will flee by my mountain valley. The valley of the mountains will extend to Azal. And you will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. In the day of the, of the earthquake, in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God will come and all of the holy ones with him. I just want to skip down. Uh, look at verse 13. It says, And this will be the plague the Lord strikes all the peoples with who have warred against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. And their eyes were rot in their socket, and their tongues were rot on their mouths. On their, okay, it's just kind of, uh, kind of a wow. Let me do this quickly. Let me go to Revelation chapter nineteen. Revelation chapter nineteen, and this is kind of when Jesus. Comes. Okay. Um, I want to skip down. Oh. So I'm just going to read verse 11 again. I'm just going to, I'm going to skip. I'm going to scroll through, but look, he said, and I saw heaven, I saw the heavens open, and there was a white horse. His right is called faithful and true. He judges and he and he judges and makes war in righteousness. Uh, let me skip down to verse 19. And notice this. He says, Then I saw the beast. Now remember the same arrogant man who makes great boasts against God. And I saw the beast. Uh saw the beast. The kings of the earth and the armies gather together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his armies. But the beast was taken prisoner, along with him the false prophet, who had performed signs in his presence. You have to read that in, in chapter 13. He deceived those who accept the mark of the beast and those who worship his image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with fire, and the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the mouth, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So when he says, remember we just read in Zechariah that their feet, that, their, that they were rot, their skin rots on them, their flesh rots on them at their standing. This powerful image of Jesus coming back and, and again, annihilating them. So as you can see right here, um, when he says, verse 45, he would pitch his tent, his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain, but he would meet his end with no one to help him. Why? Because he's fighting against Jesus. All of those boasts, <laughs> all of those boasts that you see that he has, all of those boasts, Jesus is going to say, okay, here, we're going to see about that. Notice, and, and what is interesting about his end is he's not going to even face the, the great right throne judgment. Notice it says that he has taken him and the false beast and the false prophet, they're thrown alive into the lake of fire. That their judgment is already set. It's almost like he's judging them like an angel. And then later we see that Satan is also thrown with them after the thousand years is, is complete. All right, guys, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome, and I will see you in the next study.